Hello, and welcome to this very special NCRP webinar, Moving a Progressive Agenda in this Time of Crisis. I'm Aaron Dorfman, and I'll be your host today. Thank you for making the time to join us. Before we get started, I want to acknowledge what happened in my home state of Minnesota earlier this week. George Floyd, a black man, was murdered by white police officers. It's yet another horrific example of the anti-blackness of this nation. Shocking, but not surprising. I know everyone on this call is outraged that police killings of black men continue so regularly and that we're all committed to building a country where everyone is safe and can thrive. So it's good to be among friends and allies at a time like this. Today's conversation is about funder strategy during the crisis brought on by the coronavirus pandemic. But it's not a funder only conversation. We are pleased to have leaders of foundations and nonprofits both on the call. If we have any reporters tuning in today, and I don't think we do, but if we do, let me remind you that this is an off the record conversation, so please respect that. Those of you who are participants today, I encourage you to put questions and comments in the chat and in the Q&A. There's tons of smart people tuned in for this webinar, and we want your voices in the mix too. NCRP's field director, Ben Barge, will be monitoring the chats and will occasionally bring important comments or questions into the conversation. To get those chats going, I'd like to invite you to put your own thoughts in there about what policy opportunities you see to advance a progressive agenda in this moment. The current coronavirus pandemic is hitting workers and immigrants disproportionately hard. Black people, indigenous people, Latinx people, and all people of color are facing the brunt of this crisis. Yet the crisis also presents opportunities to help change the conditions and policies that have made this pandemic disp disproportionately worse for communities of color. We'll explore four important questions today. Number one, how can foundations and donors who care about equity and justice best advance a progressive agenda now and in the coming months? Number two, what are the opportunities at the federal or state level within immediate COVID response efforts? Number three, how will the changing political and economic landscape open opportunities for lasting structural change later in 2020 and into 2021? And finally, what can funders do to help communities win real change and build new systems that better serve those who have been traditionally marginalized? We have an incredible panel to help us explore those questions. Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal, a Democrat representing the 7th District of Washington State and co-chair of the Congressional Progressive Caucus is with us, as is Carmen Rojas, the incoming president of the Marguerite Casey Foundation, Karen McNeil Miller, president and CEO of the Colorado Health Foundation, and Hillary Pennington, executive vice president of the Ford Foundation. Welcome to all of you, and thanks for being with us today. Congresswoman Jayapal, let me start with you. What are the opportunities you see to advance a progressive agenda at the federal level over the next few months within immediate COVID response efforts, and how can foundations and high net worth donors help take advantage of those opportunities? Aaron, first of all, thank you so much for your leadership at NCRP. It's just been a, a pleasure to watch you as you build this very important uh, base of support within foundations. And to all of my colleagues um, who are on this panel, thank you for everything that you are doing. I think that what we are seeing is incredible devastation of a scale that we simply haven't seen um, in most of our lifetimes. Uh, unemployment that has reached uh, already surpassed actually levels of the Great Depression, particularly if you take into account real unemployment. And this conundrum of uh, particularly brown and black workers, Native American workers, workers of color, who are both on the front lines in terms of essential work that needs to be done so the rest of us can stay home 
and therefore without the choice to protect themselves in those working conditions and disproportionately bearing the brunt of unemployment. And when you look at what has happened to our unemployment systems, we should remember that going into the pandemic, many unemployment systems were at their lowest staffing levels and uh, most restrictive eligibility in many states because of the work that happened after the Great Recession where many states tightened eligibility requirements so that workers of color, the lowest wage workers, um, were not even qualified to meet the unemployment restrictions in some states. So the challenge here is that we really need to do three things in my view. One is we need to get people paychecks um, so that there is certainty in their lives, so that they know that they are not gonna have to navigate numerous um, systems, whether it's the unemployment system, which even in the best states like mine with a great governor, um, a great ESD commissioner is really struggling under the strain of the numbers of people that are going on to unemployment. So the first thing is we got to get people paychecks and keep them tied to their jobs because the other thing we know about unemployment, as important as it is to expand unemployment insurance, is that folks of color are disproportionately burdened by discrimination in the workplace when they try to get off of unemployment. So during the Great Recession, so many people were unable to get off of unemployment uh, because of discrimination faced. And this is true, of course, of black workers. And now in the pandemic will also be very true of API workers who are facing a lot of hate and discrimination. Um, under my Paycheck Recovery Act, which I introduced, I think this would ensure that workers stay tied to their businesses and would ensure that businesses are able to continue their work, which is the second point that is so important. Our small businesses, our minority owned businesses, and the worker business relationship in general is critical for black and brown workers, for all low wage workers who are disproportionately affected right now by layoffs. And then the third area um, is around health care. Um, we are in a situation where we already had 87 million people who were uninsured or underinsured. And now, according to Kaiser, 27 million more Americans have lost their health insurance because it was tied to their jobs. So in my Paycheck Recovery Act, we would actually keep people on their employer-sponsored health care by covering benefits as well. But I do have other bills with Joe Kennedy, um, the Medicare Crisis Act, that would untether people um, and their health insurance from their jobs. So it would cover people that were unemployed through Medicare, cover people who are uninsured through Medicaid. I think at the end of the day, what we need to make sure of is that we understand the tremendous devastation of uncertainty, of no money in the pocket, um, particularly for black and brown workers, and the safety elements where we are putting workers in the position of having to choose between putting food on their table and actually um, being able to, to be safe. That's just not acceptable. Final thing I'll mention is immigrants. We have excluded immigrants from almost every form of relief in Congress. And this is a major, major place where I think foundations, unfortunately, will have to pick up the slack as long as the federal government refuses to recognize that the virus doesn't discriminate by citizenship. And in fact, you see the highest concentrations of COVID in uh, the Latinx populations and meatpacking plants and elsewhere. So uh, I know those are a, a lot of different pieces here, but I think that the overall uh, situation for workers of color in particular, who make up the disproportionate level of low wage workers on every level, they are getting slammed and we desperately need help. I'm trying to do that here in Congress, but obviously a place where the foundations and philanthropic sector can, can play an in, in enormous role. Great, thank you so much. Um, Carmen, maybe let's bring you in on the conversation here. You've been focused for the past several years on advancing workers' rights, and now you're moving into the role of foundation president. And you wrote a powerful piece early in this crisis about how philanthropy must show up differently in this moment. So what are the key things that 
foundations and high net worth donors uh, can and must do now and for the next year or so if they care about moving a progressive agenda that benefits workers, immigrants, and low-income families. Oops, unmute yourself, please, Carmen. Give me one second. Hi, you got me? <laughs> you missed all of my thank you. Can you hear me now? Great, awesome. Um, so first and foremost, thank you so much uh, for having me. As I mentioned to the panelists before we started, I have yet to start my new job. I am still in the in-between. Um, and I'm excited that this is one of the first places that I get to be in conversation with my partners in this field. Um, I think this pandemic has provided yet another opportunity for philanthropy to step up. And um, to be honest, I think the jury is still out. Many institutions have spent a lot of time talking about what they're going to do as opposed to doing it. Many leaders have failed to situate the current crisis of the pandemic in the context of racialized capitalism and white supremacy. And many donors have seized this pandemic to further privatize functions of the state in ways that will continue to hurt poor families across the country. So as I've been thinking about my transition into this new role, and as I've been working with the amazing team at Margaret Casey, we've really been orienting around three big things. The first is that we are spending as much time naming those who have made gains during the pandemic as we do naming those who have been killed. And I think that this is a place where uh, philanthropy could really step up. We need to name why people have gotten sick, why they have lacked access to quality care and why they've died. And specifically why black, indigenous, immigrant and communities of color have died at horrifying rates. We need to say clearly that our family members aren't dying. They are actually being killed, killed by bad policies, killed by corporate irresponsibility, and killed by those who profit uh, and keep power because racism exists. So one thing that I think philanthropy needs to do in this moment is hold not only the victim, but also the victors in this moment, really in our line of sight. The second thing is that we are funding organizations that are working to hold those who make these choices at the expense of our families accountable and creating different conditions so that our families can actually be more powerful. The majority of our grant recipients are focused on organizing in communities of color. And I think that that is a, a emblematic and should be what the vast majority of funders should be funding. They are creating solutions and really doing the life-saving work that we can't live without. I think Marguerite Casey has a long history of offering primarily long-term general operating support. And as all of the think pieces in our sector have said, the busy work that philanthropy creates both before this moment in this mo and in this moment needs to be stopped in service of actually transforming the conditions that we're working in. The third thing, and the thing that makes me really excited about being on this panel, is that we are making sure to situate our work in the context of our democracy and our economy. I think it's um, funny, like if you just read the news or philanthropic trade journals, we would believe that we're making our way out of this one, billion, one million dollar donation at a time. And in reality, it's been our taxpayers who've made available the trillions of dollars for what little response we've gotten. Um, I wanna make sure that we are bringing to the center and supporting those organizations that are making sure that we, and have a vision for, a functioning and representative democracy organized to serve the public good and maintain a social safety net, as well as a just economy. I think that this moment uh, has made a, num a number of the failures of our current and political and corporate climate really visible, but I don't think we give up. I think philanthropy and donors have a real opportunity to double down on those that we believe um, can actually be at the forefront of creating evidence that we can have a different government, that we can have a different economy, one that includes all of us and especially the most marginalized amongst us. Thank you, Carmen. Fabulous stuff. Um, Hillary, let me pull you into the conversation at this point. Um, the Ford Foundation has arguably, arguably done more uh, than just about any other foundation to advance social justice and expand rights and opportunities for communities of color over the past several decades. Um, 
What do you see as the short-term and longer-term opportunities for philanthropy to contribute to advancing a progressive agenda in, in light of this pandemic? Well, Aaron, first of all, thanks to you for your leadership. Um, Carmen, uh, everything she said, I, I would uh, underscore. And Pramila, it's just so um, moving and exciting to see your leadership. And we all owe so much to you because philanthropy cannot replace government. And ultimately, systems change require really visionary, pragmatic uh, activists like you in government. So we thank you. Um, I think that there are a lot of short-term opportunities, you know, on voting rights and democracy, on economic relief, on worker rights. Um, and there's a, you know, to me, what's exciting in this moment is all the kinds of new organizing and energy we see from workers and communities that are disproportionately impacted, especially essential workers, low wage workers, black and brown workers. But you know, seeing organized protests that bring together Amazon workers and Instacart workers and places where we really have not seen organizing um, before and seeing ver different kinds of communities really express their demands, you know, moving from student debt cancellation to rent strikes. So that's all promising and it's possible for philanthropy actually to support that. Like there are workers and organizations who do those things um, and those organizations need support. So, you know, whether it's Jobs with Justice or United for, for Respect or the national, you know, NDWA and its domestic worker bills of rights, you know, those, those are all big and important things and they're very, very promising. Um, you know, that said, I, while I love and celebrate, even for example, what Savita Gupta, my colleague at Ford and others have been able to pull together on the, on the Families and Workers Fund, you know, it's frustrating that that fund has less than $9 million in it so far towards a $20 million or more goal when so many other kinds of funds for, you know, food or, uh, you know, um, other things that are also essential but not as political uh, manage to get a lot more charitable donations a lot more quickly. So we have, you know, I think we have a lot of work to do. And longer term, I think we have to get to work on what a recovery plan would look like that counters inequality rather than furthering it. You know, because it's not that we don't know how to reduce inequality, it's that we choose not to. So, you know, what would it take to develop and work towards a new, you know, COVID new sort of social contract? And, you know, even setting aside some of the disgusting ways in which some people are weaponizing COVID to fuel our culture wars, we in philanthropy have a really long way to go. Um, and I think we will have to change uh, a number of things in our own um, in our own practices, you know. First and foremost, um, we are going to have to fund, as Carmen was saying, um, the organizations that are the essential workers in this fight. Um, for a long time, we're going to have to take the long view and provide them not only you know generous and multi um, op multi year operating support, but grants that you know, give them confidence for five years, for 10 years, because the, this is gonna be a long-term battle. And on these issues, it means that philanthropy has to choose for organizations that are led by people of color and by women. And we know from all of the resources that these organizations are systematically under-resourced and, um, and under-supported by philanthropy. They get way fewer resources than white-led organizations. So we have to choose for them rather than taking the easy route of funding the big, already privileged um, NGOs. It's not to say they're not important. It can be both and and not either or, but we have to overcorrect for organizations that are led by people of color and, and frontline um, leaders with a kind of moral authority and lived experience that helps them have practical solutions work and make a difference. And then last but not least, I think we have to be brave and stay with it. You know, progressive philanthropy, let's be honest, has not been as successful at the long game as conservative philanthropy, which has patiently, generously, and strategically funded, you know, ideas, individuals, and institutions over years, and instantiated ideas um, like we are only a country of individualists you know, we, we want a small, we want a small government. We are many things other than that. And in addition to that, but we in progressive philanthropy have tended to steer grantees towards our projects, our priorities, rather than giving them the support and freedom to lead where they say, see fit. We've forced the field, you know, to silo and focus on projects and compete with each other rather than helping them really be able to operate as separate tentacles of a strategically conjoined whole. 
So I think we have to ask ourselves, have we handicapped the field when it comes to these big movement moments? We are in a big movement moment right now and we have to step up. And in some ways we have cultivated a kind of learned helplessness on the part of the fields, you know, to look for funding and turn yourself into a pretzel in order to line up with a priority of a given foundation. And that's on us. And in a time when the nonprofit sector is in free fall and organizations are, you know, uh, themselves in crisis, we should not expect grantees to ask us to, to fundamentally change the relationship that they have with us. We have to do it. Um, we have to make the offer and the invitation to them. And we have to step up and do it individually and much more strategically together. Great. Thank you, Hillary. Inspiring stuff. Um, Karen, let's get you in on this conversation now. Um, the Colorado Health Foundation has been very involved in shaping the response of state government. Um, I'd love for you to tell us what you've done so far, how effective those efforts have been, and what do you see as opportunities for foundations to influence state governments over the next 10 months or so? Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Aaron. I am really excited to be part of this panel with these three fierce women. And I see some, some friends on the participants list and some old friends and some new friends. So thank everybody for participating. So yes, at the Colorado Health Foundation, we have been able to influence and drive the design of the governor's COVID response uh, fund in the state. That happened when two parallel tracks merged. The first track was right after the COVID, or after COVID became a real thing and we all figured out, yes, this is, this is gonna really impact. The Colorado funders got together and started thinking about a, a joint fund of funders. Separately, the governor uh, announced he was starting a, a fund. And the majority of the foundation said, well, let's, there's no need to have two funds. Let's just go, let's just mer put our funds there with the governor's fund. There were actually two foundations. We, we were one of them and the Colorado Trust was the other who I, were the two uh, holdouts. And I, we are, I think we're, we're two of the largest foundations in the state. We were the holdouts because their version of equity was, we're gonna make sure it spreads across the state. And it's not just, um, not just anchored in all of the urban areas. And so we said that really doesn't meet our definition of equity and, and we, where's the community voice in this? And so we were holding out. At the same time, the governor was asking foundations and philanthropy, can you help us organize and stand up this fund? And with so many of our foundations being smaller, they, they were saying, we just don't have the capacity. So I volunteered our staff to do that. But with that volunteering came the design of the process and the design of the requirements. And so we were able to, we felt comfortable then moving our, putting some funds into the governor's effort because we were able to expand the definition of equity so that the fund was designed for uh, lower income Coloradans, my, migrant, immigrant, refugee, minority communities, communities who uh, had little power or privilege. And we were able to really drive the equity lens in the design, in the communication, that there's very, it very clearly states who the funds are for. And then we were able to design the process, which included a community voice committee that informs the review process. So before grants are reviewed, we listen to the voices of the community. These were lived experienced Coloradans. These were uh, grassroots organizations who were on the ground and had the pulse of the community. They told us, here's what the community needs are. Here's what's dominant and prominent. And then those became the priorities for the, and the lens through which the review committee reviewed grants. So it has been a great partnership uh, with the state. So not only were we able to try to move that agenda, but we moved their agenda. We're helping move their agenda and understanding of what equity is. And I think we all have that opportunity because if any of your states were like Colorado and facing 
huge um, debts, they're looking at for all the usual and not so usual suspects for advice. And I think this is an opportunity, a clear opportunity for us to use our other tools of philanthropy, because we all know the grant making tool isn't the tool we have to offer for budget deficits for our states and local governments. But we can use our, um, our you know, this is a time to wield the power that we have and, and be the influencers. It's, uh, it's this a time that we can say to the governor's office or to DHS or to whatever department of government that is in our wheelhouse, you know, I'll lead that committee for you. Let me take that off your hands. Let us lead, let us, we'll lead that committee. And then that usually gives you the opportunity to, to craft the committee the way you want, drive the agenda, volunteer for, the, for, your, for our state governments. I think that's a huge way that we can directly impact the direction of state government, certainly funding advocacy groups and particularly grassroots advocacy, um, advocacy efforts uh, is a way to, to move state government. And I haven't seen a lot of success at the, this yet at the state at the state level. And some of the folks on the on the call may know this, but we've had success on the, the municipal level of government in introducing impact investors into local government and to local government to to for innovative efforts and for efforts that are truly focused on those vulnerable populations, those populations that that aren't um, have that historically don't have privilege and power, who historically have been easily easily ignored. We've been able to to use the power of impact investing, and I think that's the way we can use another one of our tools. Also, where I think all of us, everybody on this call has a has a blog, has a website, has a newsletter. The the power of the voice we have and the distribution channels we have to consistently create an agenda, consistently put out a set of messages that put a stake in the ground, which sometimes we are, uh, we are loath to do. And to, I think it was Hillary's point, we haven't been as successful as some of the cons our conservative colleagues because they put a stake in the ground. They put a stake in the ground and then they tether all of their communications, all of their actions, all of their conferences around those stakes. I think we can start doing those kinds of things as well. That's great. Thank you, Karen. I really appreciate how you and the foundation have been wielding your power in this moment. Um, it's good stuff. Um, I want to bring up a couple of things from the chat box. Um, Participants are dreaming big about what policies we could win in this moment. Um, Angelique has raised uh, universal basic income, mandatory paid family leave, even reparations um, she thinks might be possible in this moment. Uh, Robert has said uh, extension of health coverage to immigrants, regardless of their status, and elimination of the public charge rule. And uh, David raised uh, we need protections for farm workers and freezes on evictions in this moment. So I'm glad to see people's um, imaginations are expansive about what might be possible. Um, Pramila, I want to ask you a, a question. Um, you know, everyone here has been saying we need to fund activists and organizers and, and advocacy groups, but you're on the inside now. I mean, does it really make a difference to the outcome of the legislative fights whether groups like Center for Popular Democracy or Faith in Action or uh, Jobs with Justice, whether they have the resources to be uh, uh, rabble rousing, does that really impact what happens on the Hill or not? Oops, you're muted. You're muted, Pramila. You know you're talking to an activist of 20 years, so 1,000% yes, absolutely it makes a difference. Um, you know, we have so many lobbyists who are paid from the largest corporations right outside our door. And what we've been trying to do is build an alternative voice for working people. And I think that's what a lot of the, the groups that you mentioned are trying to do is actually get the voice of working people in to be able to advocate instead of having people just listen to paid lobbyists 
who are advocating for a tiny slice of Americans and not for working people. And I guess, you know, going to Karen's point, uh, I just want to urge people to be really bold. And I know we say that a lot, but we are in a crisis of epic proportions. I mean, in a couple of weeks, we will pass the number of American lives lost that we lost during World War I. We are already far past the Vietnam War, decades of the Vietnam War. And when you look at the names of lives lost, what you will see is a big category of elders and then an enormous category of workers of color and low wage workers who increasingly are on the front lines of the crisis. If you look at the economic devastation, this is coming on top of a time when we were already at the worst inequality in the, since the 1920s, actually. So when you have 60% of Americans who don't even have um, 400 bucks in their bank account for an emergency, and you put this pandemic on top of it, you are talking about structural problems that existed prior to COVID, even prior to Donald Trump, um, that, that were already in place that disproportionately burdened certain groups of workers. Talk about healthcare. It isn't just healthcare for immigrants, which as you know, Erin, I'm passionate about, I've been working on. I have a bill in Congress right now called the HEAL Act that would allow um, healthcare for everybody, would remove the five-year bar for legal permanent residents to get access to healthcare and a number of other things. But it's about healthcare for everybody. I mean, when you look at who is succumbing to this disease and you look at the proportion of African-Americans, 70%, 81% in places like Chicago, Milwaukee County of the fatalities when they only comprise a third of the population, what you see is a series of conditions that have put certain communities of color at risk of the worst kinds of um, contraction of the virus and the fatality. So it's not that people of color just don't care about their health. It's that they're situated in communities next to toxic waste dumps. They are most likely to not have any kind of health insurance at all. They are most likely to not be able to pay for health care even when they have health insurance. And so because of that, they have, they have gotten the underlying conditions that are actually make them most at risk for fatalities. Same thing with housing. You know, you see the spread of the virus in farm worker housing, in places where we know that communities of color tend to live in much more closely populated, densely populated neighborhoods, but also homes. You have generations of people living together. Physical distancing is not possible when you have three generations of people living in a relatively small living space. And so all of these things have to be addressed. And foundations absolutely have more tools in their toolbox than just grant making. Advocacy is important. It is chairing committees, of course, but it's also writing op-eds. It's calling your members of Congress who pay attention to the wealth of philanthropy to address these deep inequities that are built into our system. And so um, I would you know, I would pay less attention to what is politically possible because ultimately I believe what's politically possible is what we make possible. And I think that foundations have an important role to play in saying, you know what, healthcare as a right and not a privilege is critical for us to do in this moment. And um, same thing around income, same thing around worker rights that Carmen was talking about. Uh, we, we don't even have OSHA standards for PPE and safety equipment for workers that we're pushing back to work right now. We'll have a hearing on that in Congress. But we desperately need people to stop looking at leadership in the context of, of where we are, you know, and what's politically feasible, but actually in the context of being a little lonely in being out there in front to say, this is not going to work anymore. And we are challenging you, our leaders in Congress, in the House, in the Senate, and in the presidency to do better, and we will help to lead the way in creating that movement. I just can't emphasize that enough. It can't be left just to us because, frankly, government right now, as it's structured, has way too many corporate interests um, built into the ways in which we make decisions and the power structures that are, and we desperately need the help from, um, from all of you who have significant positions of leadership in major institutions that are helping states 
um, to, to weather the crises that we have. Thank you. Um, I have a question in a minute for the three foundation leaders on the panel, but first, do any of you want to respond to anything that Pramila just said? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think the, um, the thing that has been really trying for me pre-pandemic, uh, I've spent my life in the nonprofit sector, in philanthropy, philanthropy adjacent. Um, and I think that there has been this way, it's not only that the right has been more effective, is that the right has made uh, clear ideological choices about what they believe we deserve as a country, as citizens, as non-citizens, as contributors to this country. And I think liberal center to uh, left philanthropy has often left that terrain open. So we find ourselves um, hemming and hawing over whether or not we can say, we believe every worker who works shouldn't be poor. We should actually disabuse ourselves of the idea that there is a working poor and our work should actually be creating standards so that work and poverty aren't commingled as opposed to funding organizations, funding strategies, funding initiatives that help, um, that are a band-aid to the poverty that poor people are facing. Similarly, with criminalization and police, you know, I think Aaron, you're, I really appreciate you mentioned what happened uh, in Minneapolis. I am so struck by how reticent philanthropy has been to be an abolitionist philanthropy. We actually have resources and knowledge that uh, allow us to take the boldest steps to say, actually, you know what? The police has done very little to serve our communities. Our, Latinx communities, immigrant communities, black communities. Let's imagine something different. Let's fund those organizations that know that putting people in cages is actually not leading to any sort of redemption or healing. It's actually making things worse in our country and starting to support organizations that can be on the front line of creating evidence of what's possible for us is really critical. Again, not only in this moment, I think the um, I started in philanthropy uh, in 2008 and have uh, made my way through many crises. Hurricane Katrina, I have seen like the, the ebb and flow, like the, the chest puffing uh, courage that happens in crisis. And I just hope that we are actually able as a sector to hold oxygen longer and in a more sustained way so that it isn't just reacting to the moment. We have the gift of resources and time. And I think that we need to put those gifts uh, in action in a deeply ideological way, not compromising anything um, in the ways that the right has been really effective at doing. Amen to that, Carmen. Erin, can I just add one thing to what Carmen was saying and to what I was saying earlier? I'll give you an example. You know, I mentioned my Paycheck Recovery Act, which is a big program. I get that it's a big program. It actually is what every other country in the world has already done and put in place. So it's not that big that it can't be done, nor is it that big that we didn't do it for the airline industry. We actually did the exact same thing for the airline industry in CARES 1. So why can't we do that for workers across the country so that we have in place a system and by the way, it would be a system like Germany put in after the last great recession, where any time unemployment reaches a certain level, this kicks in. You don't have to wait on Congress to actually get there. But the idea, sometimes for some of us on the left, we have been so beaten into submission around protecting our safety net systems that the idea that we would actually protect paychecks um, it, it, you know, that we would actually protect the worker business relationship is almost too hard for us to wrap, uh, wrap our heads around. And that we would actually be able to do it for every worker because 40% of workers who have been laid off, guess what? They work for uh, companies that have more than 500 employees. So it doesn't help just to say, well, we're going to support only the workers that work for small businesses. If you work for a restaurant chain that has 1,500 employees, perhaps even provides you with healthcare benefits, 
and a $15 minimum wage or higher, why would that worker not have their paycheck protected in the same way that a worker who works for a McDonald's franchise that doesn't have benefits and doesn't even pay a $15 minimum wage perhaps, um, why would that worker's paycheck get protected but the worker that works cleaning a restaurant that is more than 500 employees not get protected? So I do think that you know, it would be very, I'm still in the midst of this battle, as you can tell. So if I can use this call for my own advocacy, let me say that I hope that every one of you thinks about really pushing this idea forward because let's talk about state and local revenues. My University of Washington Medical Center is about to lay off 15% of its employees because they don't have revenue. My local, I represent seven cities, not just Seattle, which Hillary knows and would have been a constituent if you had stayed here, Hillary. Um, but you know, these local and state governments are laying off their workers and the, and the Paycheck Recovery Act would apply to state and local governments as well so that layoffs would be protected there. So I would just urge us to think boldly about what the answers are. Politics is the art of the possible. And we should be in the business of pushing the limits of what is seen as possible because that is not the same as what is actually possible. And foundations can help us not only through your grantees but through your own advocacy to say this is the solution, these are the kinds of solutions we should be pushing. And sorry for my, my getting animated about this, but it's incredibly frustrating to me to watch these unemployment levels continuing to rise. And everybody's saying that the unemployment insurance system is going to fix it. It's not going to fix it. In Florida, if you earn a, below a certain wage, you don't even qualify for unemployment. So let's not think that unemployment insurance is the way that we're going to deal with this. Let's actually look at the dignity of work and the fact that workers want to work and they want to be paid for their work and have the certainty of a paycheck. And thank you for letting me get on the soapbox for a minute. <laughs> thank you for getting on the soapbox. That's exactly the kind of um, smart solutions that we wanted to bring to the attention of all of NCRP's members and followers so that folks can start advocating and uh, for, for these kinds of things. So. But Aaron, Aaron, can I just chime in on that? Um, you know, so this is the thing, the, that is a big, that, that idea is big enough for the moment and it's practical and it's, you know, and it's doable. So I think the thing we, one thing we need to do as we use our voices is, is to align around things that are concrete, not just values and words, but like five things that if, if we could support them over time and maybe it doesn't get across the line the first time. You know, maybe it takes several tries to get it across the line, but, but we have to keep repeating, um, repeating and repeating both the values and then the things that make them practical. And I think, you know, it, it, people can't create something that they can't imagine. And we've given up imagining, Carmen, to your point, that, we, that things can be different uh, and they can be. So I, I think, um, you know, what I love about the composition of this call, actually, is it's all different kinds of philanthropy, right? I mean, I, I think, Karen, there's so much, in some ways, the, the biggest innovation, I often think, is at the state and local level in philanthropy, as in the country. Uh, and we, you know, we're bad as national, at na as national foundations in figuring out how best to partner with you and to do that, you know, over the long haul. Small foundations, you know, that have strong principles and stick with things over a long period of time, you know, of which Marguerite Casey is an icon. Um, they, you know, they, they are like the tugboat that can turn the ocean liner and foundations like mine are like an ocean liner. Um, but you need, you know, you need them all to, uh, to align. And, and then I think Aaron, you know, and, and CRP, you need places they, they come to be in common cause and to learn together. But I think if we waste this, mo you know, if we don't get concrete in a moment like this um, around a handful of things, then I think we really, um, we, really, we lose the opportunity to do what's called from, for us. Yeah, thank you, Hillary. Um, so in response to this sense of urgency that we all feel, um, many foundations have decided to increase their giving, um, both in response to the horrible crisis that we face, but also to take advantage of the opportunities that the crisis is creating. So Mary Reynolds Babcock Foundation has doubled their grants budget. Wallace Global Fund went to a 20% payout this year. Libra Foundation doubled their grants uh, budget this year as well. 
I'm curious whether uh, Ford, Marguerite Casey, and Colorado Health are uh, increasing spending at all in 2020 and 2021, and if so, by how much and how did you come to those decisions? So we did. We, we had a conversation. Uh, we had a conversation as a board um, a year ago. Uh, actually preparing for a crisis. I feel like everybody to uh, the Congresswoman's point, like we have been living, our communities have been living in crisis uh, since 2008 and many of our communities have been living in crisis pre-2008, right? And so our board last year made a decision that we would, in a moment of crisis, peg our payout for the subsequent three years to our peak endowment uh, amount. So it, would, uh, it wouldn't fluctuate and so that we could actually not pull back, make the choice to not pull back funding in the moment of crisis like many foundations have and instead say, we have benefited as institutions from these tax breaks. We have benefited from a distorted market that has inflated our endowments. And it is our job to hold ourselves accountable and, and responsible for those benefits. And so for the next three years, we will be paying out um, what we would have paid out if we were in December 2019. This is Karen. Our board immediately, it just so happened that I think we went virtual on a Monday and then the next Tuesday was a board meeting. And um, it was so apparent to the board what was going on. So our, our, what we've done is this year we're doing 125% of payout. And next year it will be at least 125% of payout depending on which of, the, which of two or three scenarios that we're looking at um, play out over time. Uh, us too, you know, we are, uh, we already pay out well above the limit and because we're big, that's a lot. If we pay out closer to 6% a year, it's close to $100 million more in grants. So we're not stepping back from that. But we are also in the middle of a big conversation with our board about a big ask to do a lot more. So stay tuned. But, uh, but we all should be doing this. You know, it's, it's, it's the right, it's the right thing to do. Absolutely. Thank you guys. Um, Ben, let me uh, go to you and see what interesting questions may have come up in the chat. Uh, I know you've been monitoring that for us. Sure. Well, I want to echo um, Aaron and NCRP's thanks to all our panelists here for everything that you're doing and, and for, for the leadership that you're showing in the sector. And I want to thank everyone who's been uh, commenting and leaving questions uh, in the chat. Um, whether or not we can get to all of them, keep them coming, and we'll try to integrate those into um, the conversation. So one really great question from Christelle was, you know, how can foundations, in addition to their grant making, use their social capital to influence government response? You know, what have, what have you found useful in the work that you do and what does that strategic partnership look like? Well, for, partly for us, this, this isn't new because of COVID, uh, but it has been an emergence as we have adopted an equity lens, it's putting some stakes in the ground around, if you want to have access to our money, these are the things we need to see of you and your organization in its equity journey. And that includes state government. We get lots of grant applications from state governments to help you know, improve WIC, WIC um, applications or, or insure uninsured. And putting some of those stakes in the ground to say there's some there's a price to entry, and that price to entry is your focus on equity and being deliberate and intentional in a journey towards equity. I would just say um, a couple of things. One, think about 501c4 funding. I think a lot of foundations don't do this um, because they're worried about the tax consequences, but both within 501c3, you can, you can take an H election as a 501c3, as long as your foundation dollars permit you to do that, um, you can do more advocacy even as a 501c3. A 501c4 gives you even more flexibility and I would encourage foundations to recognize the, the need for that advocacy and congratulations to Margaret Casey for, for doing a lot of that over the course of your time. Um, but I think that that is really important. Secondly, 
the data is very, very important. We do not get data on racial disproportionality, racial equity issues, and not only putting, you know, funding the research and the data, but also finding ways. You can do briefings with us in Congress. Um, you know, I can pull to, I can sponsor a, a member briefing, and we can get you in to present that data from whatever group is is putting it forward. So that credible data is incredibly important. And the more you can allow people to distinguish by district as you do that data, the better it is for us because we make decisions based on our constituents and our districts. So disaggregating that data by district, critically important. And then the third thing, um, quickly, I would just say that it's, it is the public voice. You know, your uh, particularly top managements of foundations have a lot of contacts. And we do power maps and organizing. We look at who knows who and how do you influence a decision? And it's often not in public. It's often, you know, who knows who because their kids went to school together or whatever. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of our communities don't have those contacts that you do. So be bold about using them and push. Don't try to be reasonable. We are not in a time of reasonableness here. We are in a time, and I, I, I'm preaching to the choir with this particular panel. Every one of you is doing this. Um, but, you know, just broadly, I feel an urgency. I think we all do. Um, and we need your voices and your leadership to really push for a different kind of response than, than anything we have seen to date. Great. Thank you. Um, I, can really I just add really, really quickly, Aaron? Sure. I, so for one of the things that we see to just to your last uh, point, Congresswoman, is uh, right after the uh, pandemic hit Seattle, um, Ibram Kendi reached out and was like, hey, it turns out nobody's disaggregating data by race. One state at the start of the pandemic was disaggregating data by race. We were able to see the research for the, ra the COVID racial data tracker, and now it's available online, and now 49 states are, have the infrastructure to make that happen. It was not a huge grant, it was, uh, but it proved to be catalytic, and so um, I think that there's a way in which foundations can fund data for our own purposes, but funding data in a context where it can empower our elected officials, where it can empower our citizens to be able to move agendas and to move their work can be really powerful. And we have the ability to move that money pretty quickly. Um, that's a really like a, a front of mind example, given what you're describing. And I would also say that poll data that foundations can support polls that can be easily disaggregated by congressional district or senate district. Um, I know legislators pay a lot of attention to those kinds of to those data as well. Great, and Pramila, totally agree with you on the need for the C4 funding. We hear that all the time from the movement organizations that we're partnering with on our movement investment project. Um, and the next issue of our journal will have a piece about. Uh, by some of the leading C4 funders in philanthropy and why they do it. So um, folks, you know, and, and there, are, there are mechanisms for that. So like even for funders where it's hard to do C4, there, there are a growing number of funder collaboratives, you know, so you can put money into a common pool and some of those funders that that collaborative fund can have a C4 function, even if you yourself can't. Um, but, but then it is driving towards a common set of objectives. So this new, collaborative for um, racial and gender equity is is an example of that. And I think we we all, you know, collaboratives are very, funder collaboratives are a big trend and we should be more strategic uh, and more and, and more risk taking in what we do with them. Absolutely. Um, so we're gonna pause for a quick second here. Um, participants stay with us. Um, Congresswoman Jayapal and uh, Hillary Pennington both have hard stops at one o'clock. So I'm gonna give them a chance to get in a closing word uh, here or a call to action. And then we'll continue uh, with Carmen, Karen and myself answering uh, further questions that have come up in the chat. So um, uh, Hillary, let's have you go first. Any uh, closing thoughts or a call to action for anyone on this call? You know, I think we've, I, I have so little to add to the really powerful words of my colleagues and it's been such a privilege to um, be with all of you and hear you. You know, listening especially to you, Pramila, I think um, if I could do one call to action, it would be for foundations to just stop talking and start and, um, and act and, you know, and, and do it in a way that is planful for the long run. You know, I think we spend so much time thinking about 
individual grants to individual organizations rather than doing our own power mapping and really looking at the big ecosystems that we are trying to change and what it will take to change them um, over time. This is a movement moment where we need to do more and it is also a generational, you know, a generational battle to instantiate a different set of ideas about what America should be and, and can be. So I would say, let's stop talking, <laughs> and start acting more and hold ourselves accountable for doing that. Great. Pramila, closing thoughts from you. And thanks yeah, for being here. Um, thank you so much for, for doing this. And thank you to uh, all three of my fantastic panelists for everything that you're doing and everybody that's listening. I think your grant making and coalition building is even more critical if that were possible in solving the immense challenges that we face now in the midst of this um, both economic and public health crisis. And I really do believe, having relied on foundation funding for 20 years of my activist life, that foundations do have the power to bring forward not only funding but attention to the smartest, boldest ideas and the smartest, boldest people that are tackling those challenges on the ground. Um, I think that, that all of my panelists know that when we put dollars and boots on the ground towards progressive priorities, that's really when we're able to build a national movement for social justice that can't be ignored. And so um, thank you for all the work that you're doing. Erin, thank you for your tremendous leadership at NCRP and for holding these conversations so we can talk about what's going on. And, and yes, Hillary, I am with you. Uh, let's, let's also not just talk, but act. And I'm just really honored to be a part of the conversation and in collaboration with, with all of you doing such tremendous work. Thank you. Great. Thanks to you both for joining us. And um, we'll be with you next time. And uh, uh, Karen, uh, Faye Tversky had a question for you about um, were the needs uh, identified by the community reviewers different from the professionally identified needs? And if so, in what ways? A they were a little bit different. The headlines were the same, but the nuance on the ground was different. So the, the headlines would be food. The nuance would, would tell us, it's not just who we would think, children uh, who were on friend reduced lunch, it's not just seniors, it's not just the homeless, but it's uh, LGBTQ youth who are isolated and don't have their space to go to anymore. It's um, immigrants who were working in food production but are no longer. So the on the ground voices gave more context and depth and texture to what the higher ups would have said. So it helped us refine and target. Great, thank you. Um, I also want to point out that um, Alliance for Justice has been posting their Boulder advocacy link in the chat and we find those resources super helpful. I think other funders will um, as well. So if you're not familiar with those, uh, check them out. AFJ is a great, great partner for us. Um, ben, do you have another one that you want to bring to our attention? Yes. Um, so um, Lo Suz, and uh, apologies if I've mispronounced your name, and Sierra and others have really talked about the importance of foundations getting ahead of narrative around the disaggregation of data. So when we're talking about how the COVID-19 pandemic disproportionately affects communities of color, low-income folks, immigrants, LGBTQ uh, communities, um, there can be a tendency, and Diane raised this for Texas, uh, for sometimes the government response to then be actually to open up sooner because there's less concern and less regard for these communities who are already not represented as they should be and these, among these decision makers who are making these decisions. So um, how, are, how do you think about the ways philanthropy can not only promote the district aggregation of data, but really be proactive in helping movement partners, whether they're fighting for um, stopping evictions or reproductive justice or other racial justice concerns um, to, to fight for that with everything that they can use? Uh, Ibram Kendi's work 
we funded alongside of that some work that Color of Change was doing on decarceration. And I feel like Color of Change has been a critical, re provided a critical resource in this moment for Framing the Nature to actually have this right here. This has like been making the whole moves around our office. And I feel like everybody who works in philanthropy and in our sector should really download this and read it. Because I think it, uh, for me at least, it's been able to shift the framing away from people are dying willy-nilly or um, uh, it stops creating the opening for people in our media, our political leaders, our corporate leaders to place the burden on people of color for dying because of pre-existing conditions or, or whatnot. And instead actually holds our political leaders and our corporate leaders accountable for making a set of choices that exposes people in our community at greater rates, right? That uh, the set of workers who are on the front lines are overwhelmingly black, indigenous, Latinx workers. That the set of um, people who can't, you know, as Representative uh, Diapol was saying, I think that there's a, um, uh, a belief that we can, everybody can just stay at home in their house and uh, you know I am I feel very privileged in this moment but know that the vast majority of people that I grew up with the vast majority of people in my family can't afford that um, that there is no sustaining structure and so what we have done and committed to as a foundation is to funding not only the research and data but pairing it with organizations like color of change that take that data and frame it in the context of historical racism and white supremacy and i think this is an absolute opportunity for us in philanthropy because now something external sh shown this light that some people were people in power of privilege chose to ignore, um, could easily ignore, or could claim was invisible. Now the light has been shined so brightly on it that part of our job is to keep that light there. And because it's not a surprise, the people who live it every day, it is not a surprise to them. I've seen, you know, black folks post on Facebook, you know, just another day in the neighborhood, we're dying more. We're sick or more, you know, welcome to our world. So I think there's a light being shined now that we have an obligation of talking about putting a stake in the ground of, of not letting it go dark and not letting it go dark after the immediate crisis pass. But we take the long-term view and we use this time to really start to dissect you know, historical, um, long-standing discrimination uh, racism, overt and, and um, covert uh, racist policies, policies that are barriers. And so I think we, we, this is a golden opportunity and I hope we don't fritter it away. Yeah, totally agree. Um, you know, an issue we haven't touched on yet is um, reproductive justice. Um, the right has used this crisis as an opportunity to curtail access to abortion and to control women's bodies uh, to an even greater extent than they were doing so before. So, um, I mean, are we just um, stuck playing defense during this time or is there any opportunities to advance uh, reproductive justice in, in the coming months? What do you guys see on that? I, I say yes to both. Yes, we have to play the defense so we don't lose the gains we we have but I, there's always an offense we have to play i actually think there's a unique opportunity to couple reproductive rights with the 100th anniversary of women's right to vote which is 2020 and try to mobilize women and get women uh, out to the polls and and mobilize the women that people don't want out to the polls. And I was interviewed yesterday, there's someone in Colorado is gonna do a, a series around the, the 19th Amendment. They were asking me like how I feel, you know, why do I vote and you know, how do I feel about the 19th Amendment? And I started out by saying, you know, as an African American, like a lot of things, it's complicated how I feel about the 19th Amendment because it was a process that was driven by and essentially designed for wealthy white women and that suffrage movement 
intentionally dis, um, distance itself from working class white women and really distance itself from the black suffrage, black women's suffrage movement because they needed the votes of the South. They needed the support of the South. And so even though that right was granted, there was rampant racial terrorism. There was rampant uh, threatened and, and carried out bodily violence on people. And so folks, my parents would say that it was, that it was Voting Rights Act of 1965 that really gave them the right to vote and not the 15th or the 19th Amendment. However, I think we can use that 19th Amendment and, and the 100th anniversary of the women's right to vote to say, women, exercise your power. Don't give away your power. Take back your power. And that's a, that's a, it's a moment we should be able to capitalize on. Yeah, I really agree with Karen. I love that. I love this framing. Like, um, I, uh, many of our institutions, regardless of the size, have resources to both walk and chew gum in this moment, right? So we should be, one, working to protect and defend uh, women's access to abortion, but the broader set of reproductive uh, and gender justice uh, issues right now to stop any sort of backsliding, but also um, continue to support to support those organizations and leaders that know we need a new um, uh, and that are working for a new set of conditions for women for trans folks for queer folks for folks who lack access to care broadly i think that this moment has been able to create um connectivity uh, or visibility of connectivity across issues uh, in ways that um, other moments haven't made so visible. And so I think that, yeah, we have to be able to walk and chew gum, uh, protect what we have, and also support those organizations that are working for more. Great. Thank you both. Um, so we, we've certainly been talking about um, the need for support for immigrant communities at this time. Um, NCRP two weeks ago released a new 50 state dashboard showing the local to local funding uh, for immigrants and the pro immigrant and pro refugee movements. So we showed in each state the 10 largest funders in that state to that state and then uh, how well do they support immigrants and the pro immigrant movement. Mm. Um, and, you know, not surprisingly, uh, levels of support are quite low, and most funders uh, don't consider themselves an immigration funder. Uh, they might say, I'm a workforce funder, or I'm a health funder, or I'm a this funder. Um, Karen, you've managed to sort of avoid those um, uh, distinctions or bifurcations. You're a health funder, but you've also done uh, pretty well in supporting immigrants. How do you how do you think about um, sort of immigrants as a part of the mission of the Colorado Health Foundation? And uh, how would you encourage other local place-based funders to reach out to and embrace immigrants in their community for, uh, for further support? Well, we recognize that immigrants and refugees are vital components to the economic, social, and cultural ecosystem and fabric of every community. And so we need them to thrive. We need them to thrive. We need them to thrive in their health. We need them to thrive educationally. We need them to thrive economically. We need them to be housed. We need them to feel fed. We need them to have what they need in order to feel like they are um, living their healthiest life, however they define health. So we don't have to I, I think that transcends the it transcends the issue area of our foundations. That if we want to contribute to a vibrant economy, a vibrant democracy, uh, a vibrant union, a vibrant educational system, an equitable system in any sense, we'd be we'd be we would be investing, and if we particularly have equity at the at the forefront would be investing in those communities that uh, need us the most and wouldn't exclude them, but make an uh, overt 
effort to to include them. I think many times though in in our field we don't know who they are and for so many reasons they aren't comfortable reaching out to us. So it puts the onus on us to be open, authentic, accessible, and seeking them. And and I would say we don't we don't invite them to our table. I think we ask their permission to sit at their table. And then we get to know them. And then we we then we can start funding their efforts as well. Carmen, anything to add on um, on that? Yeah, um, so I have been thinking a lot, you know, as Luz uh, Vega Marquis is stepping into uh, her retirement, I've had just so uh, much time to sit and talk with her over the last couple of months. And the thing that has always struck me about Luz's vision and courage and belief for us is that we don't experience issues um, as people one silo at a time, right? So I'm not only a woman one day, Latinx another day, the kid of immigrants another day, um, uh, a city planner a third day. Like I live all of those realities every single moment of my life. And I think that Luce's vision of a foundation that could offer long-term general operating support without being encumbered to the siloing of issues, believing that if we solve the issue of immigration, then that's going to be the panacea for workers in this country. If we solve the issue of gender, gender justice, and that's going to be that's going to be the panacea for the whole other set of issues. Um, I feel so privileged to be stepping into this organization uh, for a whole host of reasons, mostly because we view the, our family members as whole and the issues and identities that they hold as all being critical parts to who they are. And so I'm not surprised. <laughs> I'm not surprised that philanthropy isn't funding uh, that philanthropy broadly isn't funding people of color, Black-led, Indigenous-led, immigrant-led organizations. It's not a surprise. We see the report every week. I think some of it has to do uh, with the composition of what philanthropy looks like. Uh, and I think the other part of it is this unwillingness for even leaders of color in philanthropy to hold ourselves accountable for building and creating pathways for other folks of color in philanthropy. So I, I, I'm on the one side, not surprised, and on the other side, feel deeply privileged to be stepping into the leadership of an institution that uh, where immigration and um, migrant rights broadly uh, fits squarely into the whole host of issues that people are, fen uh, are fending against and fighting for um, while not needing to like uh, choose. And Aaron, can I also say for many of us, I think it will, it would require us to modify our definition of what, what's risk. Mm -hmm. We had to, in our organization, go, you know, battle through the, well, they're so risky. They're so little, they're so risky. And it's like, you know, these yeah. are people who know how to take two nickels and make a quarter out of it. I would argue it's more risky to give that $2 million to the university who's going to do gotcha. some community thing and get a paper out of it and then leave the community. I would argue that's more risky than giving this grassroots refugee organization, tribal organization, the $25,000 they asked for. Not agree any more than that, Karen. I actually also, you know, as I step into this role, one of the things that I've been thinking is just like the absurdity that we would use the language of risk for money that we like. This isn't my mom's money. This isn't my cousin's money. This is money that was left generations ago. That is not a part of our tax system. And the fact that we would use language like risk to assess whether or not it can have impact seems so crazy to me. Uh, and that the vast majority of funders have assumed language that actually works at cross purposes, right? That like our money is imagination money. The resources that our institutions have can start to seed, right? And start to create room for people to actually have evidence that with together, 
that with each other, that their lives can be better. And so we have been, it's been a funny, we are at this funny transition time at the foundation. So we're like, okay, so if we don't use risk, what do we use? And I'm like, well, what, a, how about not? Like do, <laughs> trying, imagining, creating, testing, right? Like I, um, I think that that's the gift of these resources and getting to run these institutions. And I think we sully those gifts when we don't treat them in that way. Absolutely. And you're getting lots of cheers on the chat, uh, Carmen, for that. Um, I'm going to start to bring us to a close here. So Carmen and Karen, put some thought into you, what you want to have as your last words. Um, I want to thank everyone who joined the webinar today. Um, our nonprofit members, we've got a summer series coming up for you. Um, so be on the lookout for that programming. Um, I mentioned that the next issue of our journal, Responsive Philanthropy, is coming out in a couple of weeks. And we've got a great piece by Nicole Marr, the new head of Group Health Foundation um, uh, in that issue, and a great piece by our board chair, Starsky Wilson, head of the Deaconess Foundation, and this piece on the 501c4 giving as well. So um, be on the lookout for that in a couple of weeks. Uh, ben shared the link in the chat to the new release from our movement investment project that shows the local to local funding. So check that out as well. Um, and I guess I just want to say to all of you, thank you for what you've been doing. And I encourage you to dream big, go bold. Now is a moment of opportunity and we've got to take advantage of it. Um, conservative funders increased their spending during the Great Recession. Liberal and centrist funders did not. They cut back. Um, and you wonder why they made gains. So we can't make the same mistake again during this crisis. And um, I just encourage everyone to really um, be bold and move forward together. Um, Karen, final thoughts from you? Thank you. Again, thank um, everyone who took the time out to uh, join the, the call. I know how many of these you have to choose from, so thank you for choosing this one. I would, I would say that I would want us to re know that we have to stay on in this one for the long term. The health impacts will go away eventually. The economic impact will probably dwarf the health impact. The mental health impact will probably dwarf the economic impact. So we need to stay in on this for the long term and not get distracted by another shiny object uh, eight months from now. So, and this is the opportunity as I offered before for us to keep the light shined or shown, I don't know the right verb, keep the light on uh, vulnerable communities, communities tr traditionally without power and privilege and, um, and let's work with them, with, for, and on their behalf uh, for the long term. Awesome, thank you, Karen, and thanks for being here today. Uh, Carmen, close us out. Uh, well, so thanks, Aaron. Like I said at the beginning, I'm really, um, I'm really glad that this is my first entry into the world of philanthropy in this new role. Karen, it was such a treat to spend time with you and just know that anything that I could be, do to be of service, I'm here. Um, I think having situational awareness is important. And so the thing that has been inspiring to me about this conversation is that we're actually talking about what we can do and the power that we have in our institution, uh, not hand wringing, not hemming and hawing and not holding back. Um, situating ourselves as proudly progressive, proudly wanting and believing that our communities not only need more, but that they deserve more and better than what they have today is the gift that we have. And it's the sort of the animating force for me in this moment. And so thank you all for joining. Like Karen, I know you have all the webinars that you could be joining. And I'm glad to have spent this time with you guys. Wonderful. Thanks so much, everyone, and uh, be safe and uh, fight hard for justice.